Hey everybody, welcome back to this series on preparing Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark. This is going to be like episode 6.5. We haven't actually played this weekend yet, and we're probably not, well no, we're not going to play this weekend at all, or on Monday. One of my players is busy, and the other three voted to not play without him, at least this week. It's actually pretty cool. They, they were like, well, we can go one week without playing, but we can't go two weeks. So if he's busy again next week, which he might be, we will probably, well, we are going to go ahead and play anyway. And so we'll just NPC him at that point. But we wanted to give him a chance to, you know, like, okay, well, we'll, we'll play, we'll, we'll skip this week. But if it's two weeks in a row, then we'll play anyway. So anyway, what that means is that we're probably only going to get one, maybe two more sessions in in October before Halloween. And I had hoped that we were going to get at least three. But I realize it's actually something that we can do that's kind of interesting. So we've played six actual sessions, which means if we get two more, that'll be eight sessions. It's kind of like a mini series. I don't know. I'm thinking of it in terms of like seasons. And I think we could make it really cool if like, I don't know. Again, it's in my head, just as a way of thinking about the whole campaign. If like at Halloween, we get to a, a sort of climax, like a season one finale and it ends. And then if players want to quote unquote renew it, right, for season two, like, like yeah, let's keep playing, then we can. So I kind of want to try to develop everything heading towards a climax at the end of season one, so to speak. So I thought two things could happen then that would make it a bit more of a climax. What if, what if uh, the whole reason they came to Barovia in the first place was because Arthur's brother has been taken by the cult. So what if when the cult attacks, his brother is among them and is like drank the Kool-Aid and now he's a full on member of the cult. Really, I'm gonna make him like a ghoul. So he's been possessed, he's dead. This is an undead body, he's a vessel for the, the, the spirit that has been put into him. And that's sort of an indication of what the cult is doing. So I think um, I was gonna have some ghouls attack. And if we go to my little document here, I was gonna have some ghouls be a part. D4 ghouls led by uh, Arthur's brother. Now I don't remember offhand what his brother's name is. <laughs> that's pretty bad. I have it somewhere in one of my notes. I think I might have it on Discord in the messages I sent to him back and forth. Um, but I'm just gonna put Arthur's brother for now. So D4 ghouls led by Arthur's brother. And that's just gonna be, I might just say like two other ghouls. Two ghouls led by Arthur's brother. So there's three ghouls in total. I think I'm just gonna say that there are um, six zombies and uh, 10 wolves, and eight wolves. This is going to be, I mean, this is a tough 3D4, so that's going to be about, we'll say that there are seven thugs, uh, or six thugs. We'll just do that back to six thugs, because uh, 3D4, on average, that's five, seven and a half, eight, actually, that'd be eight. So we're going to say eight thugs, half with crossbows. All right, so this is actually what's going to attack at least. So anyway, as I was saying, um, it's going to be like uh, the end of season one. So Arthur's brother will show up with the cult in the big climactic battle where they all actually fight uh, for the townsfolk of Barovia and Arthur's brother will have to die. And that would be like, you know, the end of the first arc because they're there to find him. They, and then he'll come down with the cult and they'll be like, oh man, okay. So the, the cult is, is turning people into these things. Um, and then at that point, they'll have done technically what they were here to do, which is to find Arthur's brother. And that would be the end of the first season's arc. Or maybe they'll just see him. Maybe he'll get away. I don't know, right? Maybe he'll, maybe he will be the werewolf. You know, that could be interesting. What if he's the werewolf that's been attacked? I'm, you know, I'm thinking this through as we go. What if it's not Luvash? What if it's Arthur's brother is that werewolf who's been attacked and he's he drank the Kool-Aid again? And we'll, I'll figure it out. Regardless, my point still stands. It's going to be... Um, a couple more sessions. So next session, they're going to be in town gathering people together. They're going to be making, getting everybody ready to evacuate. I'm pretty sure the people that they can. Uh, some of them might go to the Vistani pool because they want to find out what's going on. So they might go to the Zare pool camp and try to talk to them about what's happening, try to get some help, and then return, um, spend, spend one more night, and then leave the next morning. That might be their plan. If so, they're going to have to, they might also try to find Father Donovich because they know that he might be in the church. So they might go down there and try to kill him during the day. Um, there's a lot that they can do tomorrow, but I don't think any of their plans will be going to the Lucky. Now I have 
Uh, one of the things I'll do today is prepare some encounters on the road to Velaki, just in case that we can have a, a session of travel, make it interesting, make it kind of long, and then you know they'll, they'll we'll end that session with Velaki in the distance. So if they just leave and go to Velaki, I'll have enough to kind of do it on the way uh, and have a session of travel, and then I'll prepare Velaki before the next session. Um, in which case, well, I'll figure it out as I go. But I don't think they're going to go to Velaki. I think they're going to either spend all day in town and then leave the next morning. Um, or they're going to, they'll do something. They'll do something in town. So again, I'm not exactly sure, but it'll be, uh, uh, yeah, I think it'll be, it'll be good. So what I'm going to be planning on doing then is leaving the cult attack here in case they go to the Vizier pool and come back in case they um, just stay in town or they go down into the crypt and then come back up and that's most of the day. Like I'm going to, I'm going to focus on the cult's attack and I have that all set and then I'll just react because I know the NPCs in town. I know what they're like. And so I can role play them as the players um, interact with them. So I'm not worried about them staying in town. Uh, I, I want to make sure that the road to Velaki is prepared and I want to make sure that um, the Zair pool is prepared, but I think it is. I think I have all that already done. So then that just leaves in this video I don't know if it'll be terribly long, but I'll be preparing the travel to Velaki, talking about the final climactic sort of session and what might happen there. And then I thought it might be interesting to kind of go through practically and talk about some of the conversion um, from 5th edition to Shadow Dark, because I have the Curse of Strahd book in front of me here, but it's, um, you know, I, like just give it like an example. Like I might take like uh, Bone Grinder and talk about how one might change that to fit a, uh, a shadow dark sort of adventure rather than um, rather than just going right into uh, you know um, 5e and, and do the bone grinder as exactly uh, it was be run in 5e because it's not going to be the same it can't be the same if you just run it the same you're going to get your people killed or at least that's that's what I think you're going to get your people killed um, so I might do that too but that would be um, that would be something that we'll, uh, I'll cover later. Okay, um, what, one of the things I think needs to happen in that is you need to really connect Bone Grinder to Babala Saga. It's a major missed opportunity in my view. Now that's more story that's less particular about, like, this, um, this adventure and, like, it's more, you know, it's more about the adventure rather than the trans transition from Shadow Dark to... Uh, from 5e to Shadow Dark, but it's one thing I might talk about. Okay, uh, anyway, first thing I want to do is I wanted to make sure that I have the travel to the Locky prepared. Now, this is just my random encounters table on my pages. I've had uh, Savalich Woods encounters, which I already did. I prepared that in one of my side ones. And the same thing with the Barovian Basin. I kind of just have this, if they were to go wandering up there, I don't know why they would, but they might. Um, now I can have travel on the road to Velaki, and I have uh, Velaki Valley as well. So I have some encounters that I can kind of hunt through and see which ones I like. Now, um, a trader's caravan led by a scout. I don't think... So a wandering revenant hunting undead. Let's start there. No, I don't think I want that on the road. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, a trader's caravan led by a scout. I could see that happening, um, but... It would be weird because the whole point is that things are being locked down, and so I don't think that will make a lot of sense. They're going to get to Velaki, and they're going to realize um, that things are not good there either. Um, so I think this is going to be gone. An eccentric scholar from Velaki seeking a particular ruin. Now this one I actually like because I think um, an eccentric scholar from Velaki seeking a particular ruin. I could make that into some connection, right? Like. Um, Bad things have started to happen in Velaki. Uh, this guy, this one scholar who's like, oh, I know what this is. This is, it relates to this family history where this guy who was a servant of this evil cult or this evil of this ancient spirit, the devil, um, started to raise things from the dead. And uh, and so I have this um, book or this this holy you know, symbol or sword or something that I'm trying to seek to help us. I could see that being something they could run across on the road and it would be like a weird, uh-oh, we're just obviously going to let this guy go, right? But but maybe not. Maybe they remember where he's going to go or they 
to get him. Um, a, a faceless wraith of mist that follows the party. Now, this is something that I've used before in other um, in other Shadow Dark adventures. I shouldn't say Shadow Dark, sorry, Curse of Strahd adventures. And I like it. But I've used it with some of the players, because a couple of these players have started Curse of Strahd before. It was in 5e, it was very different. I hadn't done most of these changes. It was basically by the book. But I... Um, but they've already encountered that, and they kind of know that that's a Barovian thing. So even though I like it, I, uh, I think I'm going to delete it. Because, again, I don't want to use the same thing twice. A Traveling Vistani heading to the Zer Pool. I like that, because, again, the Zer Pool camp has... It's, it still is active. They're there. Um, a Were-Raven monitoring the road and keeping an eye on travelers. I might do that. I might keep that. I'll, I'll, I'll see that one there. All right, I'm going to delete this. Um, do I want Vampiric Mist? Um, well, hmm, do I want Vampiric Mists? It will be interesting, but I don't have that. Nope, I don't have that in my in my bestiary. So nope, it's not happening. 2d4 ghouls, uh, I don't think, uh, could be actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 2d4 ghouls feeding on a destroyed, um, uh, on a refugee caravan that didn't make it. Um, a pair of children's footprints. A child's footprints. Yeah. Child's footprints leads off into the woods. The child didn't make it. Yeah. All right. Um, child's footprints lead off. Yeah, footprints lead. All right. Child's footprints lead off into the woods. The child didn't make it. All right. Um, so that's something that they, they could find. 2d4 ghouls feeding on a refugee caravan. So they go by. There's a cart turned over. There's a couple other dead horses that are being consumed. It's very clear that, you know, like the, it was something very recently. And then these ghouls, which are now uh, roaming the woods, dead. The dead are 2d4 zombies. Maybe I'll do zombies. Yeah, I'll do zombies. 2d4 zombies feeding on a refugee caravan that didn't make it. Because uh, ghouls are stronger, much stronger. And if I go to my... Um, make sure I, I have them here. Zombies are level 2. Their mean morale checks, they're relentless. So they have this really, really hard... Now, it's DC 15, plus 2. So they have to 13. Or, so most of the time, they'll die if reduced to zero hit points. But not every time. Uh, plus 2 to hit, D6 damage. Um, yeah, they're, they're pretty good. Now, they'll, they'll be turned easily. I think 2d4 zombies, and that's number 78. 78. Um, feeding on a refugee care that didn't make it. Child's footprints leading off into the woods. The child didn't make it. Oh, yeah. Um, a refugee caravan. Um, do I want vampire spawn? No, because the vampire spawn, that wouldn't make any sense here. 2d6 wolves with 50% led by an alpha with max hit points. That's reference to D&D &D 5e, where things can have minimum or maximum hit points. This is just led by alpha with times two hit points with two times HP. Um, and wolves are, going all the way back in my sheet here, uh, wolves are number 21. Oh, I could do a dire wolf. What's the difference there? Oh, he gets two attacks, plus four with a d8. Yeah, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. He's not a dire wolf. It's just 2d4 wolf, 2d, 2d6 plus two wolves with 50% chance led by alpha with uh, 20 hit points. All right. So that's just sort of an elite wolf encounter. And that would be something interesting. Now, um, 2d4 plus 2, 2d4 plus 2 bat swarms led by a giant bat with max hit points. Do I want bat swarms? Yeah, I could do bat swarms. Uh, do I have bat swarms here? Bat. Yeah, bats and bat swarms. Perfect. So, uh, 2d4 bat swarms. That's a lot, but led by a giant bat. Also cool. What's the difference here is that the bat swarms have way more hit points. Uh, they get three attacks. Oof. Maybe I'll say just a two bat swarms led by a giant bat. 
Yeah, that's that's good. Then that's numbers one and two. Number ah, one and two. Oh, I didn't even do the wolves. Number 21, right? Yeah, 24 wolves, number 21. All right, and with 50% led by, no, just, just led by alpha. 2d6 plus two wolves, so that's a max of 14 wolves, which is really hard. No, 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 d6 plus two wolves. Yeah, d6, so that's three to eight wolves. But they, but they have morale. They can run away, especially if they get shot at. They're scared of the noise, so that should be fine. Um, it's a lot, but it's not a lot, a lot. All right, now, um, what's going to be interesting is to combine these with these, right? So, um, an eccentric scholar from Blocky seeking particular ruin, which is a burnt ruin haunted by a fiery poltergeist. So I'll cut that and put it in here. Burnt ruin haunted by a fiery poltergeist. Uh, he seeks what? What is he seeking? Uh, let me get rid of this. Get rid of all these. The interesting phenomena. Um, what is he seeking? He's seeking, um, well, this is where we're going to get my handy dandy Shadow Dark book. Um, we're going to go through, uh, doing Shadow Dark, doing premium Shadow Dark, and we're going to go through and do a magic item randomly. Um, or I'll, I'll roll on a magic item table. And then I'll adjust it, obviously, to like see what fits. But we'll do, uh, magic items. Let's see. Um, mundane items, luxury items, boons, secrets, blessings, magic item attributes. Okay, so here we go. Let's see. I need a d6 for the kind of magic item he's seeking. Three, which is a scroll. Okay. Um, 2d6, what's the benefit of the scroll? Four, so it has one benefit and one curse. It doesn't have personality. Um, okay, now, do I want to do a descriptor of it? Uh, 18, the Righteous Eye of Elemental Fury. So I like the Righteous Eye of Thundering Death. Let's see, the Righteous Eye. I'm just going to call it the Righteous Eye. So he seeks the Righteous Eye. Um, the Righteous Eye. Um, a scroll with... Now i got to go back to this and look at the cleric spells. What is the cleric spell that would be associated with this? The Righteous Eye that anyone can use. That's the that's the trick here. It'd be a cleric spell that anyone can use. Um, priest spell list or priest spell list. So the Righteous Eye um, that would be helpful in this particular uh, exam uh, prophecy. Speak with dead. Um, Blind, deafen, bless, augury. Um, the righteous eye. Uh, cleansing weapon. What's that do? The righteous fire. The righteous eye. That could be useful. Because that would give... Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not the righteous eye. It's the burning eye. A prayer scroll with... Cleansing weapon. Um, DC 12 wisdom to cast. Anyone can try. Um, takes a slot and action to use. Um, if crit fail, the prayer burns through the scroll, ruining it. Yeah, okay, so it's a scroll anyone can try repeatedly. Doesn't get used up. So it's a prayer scroll with cleansing weapon. All right, so that's what he's seeking. So you gotta fight a fiery poltergeist. Now what would that be? I gotta go down to undead, fiery poltergeist. So I could do a wraith. But instead of doing con damage, it's just simply fire. Uh, it's death touch. That's a really strong creature, level 8. I'll look back to ghosts. 
Ghosts. What do we have for ghosts? Possess. Contested Christmas check. It happens to control its actions for D4 rounds with life drain. Um, I could do ghost. Um, mummy, skeleton, white, wraith. So those are really the only... Um, I could do shadow. Yeah, instead of doing... So it does... Um, I could do a stronger shadow. Maybe it's simply a wraith. Fire wraith. I mean, that's really tough. D10 plus life drain. They've got a lot of hit points now. Three attacks, though. They can turn undead. I might just do a wraith. Um, wraith. So I'm going to add in uh, a fiery poltergeist or a fiery fire wraith. I'm going to add that to this list. EFG. Because as I said, I, I try to keep things consistent. Um, now the numbers will have to change. Hmm. I'll just add it at the end here. 81. Um, custom monsters. Oops. Custom monsters. Fire wraith. Fire pol fiery poltergeist. Poltergeist. So it's going to use the basic wraith stat block, but I'm going to change some things. We're going to go boom. Fiery poltergeist. Um, and that's going to be an 82. Now, um, it's not going to have, it's not going to be level 8. It's going to be level 6, which means that on average we're dropping, because uh, it's con is, oh, it doesn't matter. Con is 0. So hit points are calculated the same way with D8 hit points. So that's on average um, 4 and 5, 9 fewer hit points. Because uh, it's 4.5 4 for a D8 is half. So 9 which brings you down to 27 hit points. All right, so 27 hit points is much more manageable. We're gonna give him two death touch attacks and it's gonna be plus, um, it's not gonna be plus six, it's going to be plus four. And then it's gonna do uh, fire touch instead of death touch. And so it's not gonna have life drain. So it's going to be a D10 fire damage. Not that that matters. D10 fire flies. Uh, yeah. Other than that, it's all the same. It's an undead. It's not greater. Uh, only damage by silver magical sources. That's true. Incorporeal. It becomes corporeal or incorporeal. Okay, a place of attacks. That's true. And it doesn't have life drain. Um, so this thing is fire. And that's not going to be... Um, um, Maybe it also has combust or something like that. I might do a little bit of shenanigans here. Plus combust. And then I'll do combust. Combust. In place of, oh no, not in place of. Um, Close creatures, close enemies make hard dex check 15 or take d4 fire damage. Um, one enemy, one near enemy, makes hard dex check or d6 fire damage. And I'm going to drop this damage down to uh, d8. I'm going to take d8 fire damage. So basically, he gets two touch attacks, uh, and then he can do combust, which is one near enemy. Oops, that's not how you spell near enemy. Uh, makes a hard dex check. There we go. So this is my custom monster. This is number 82. That's going to go in the middle. Fire Wraith. Now, are they even going to go there? I have no idea. Maybe. Maybe not. But they might. So that's number one. 
Um, this is definitely not, I'm not going to be able in this video to do <laughs> uh, a comparison of Old Bone Grinder. I'll do that in its own separate video at some point, maybe over the course of next week, especially since we won't be playing and I won't have a, a recap video to do. Um, so Wraith number 82, Fire Wraith, or Fire Poltergeist, Fiery Poltergeist, a... Uh, scorching spirit seething with anger malice. Um, it burns all things that come near. Fiery poltergeist. Okay, cool. So that's number 82. So that's what this is going to be. Number 82. The scholar, uh, an eccentric scholar named... Um, Frogen, 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 Mirinsky, Mirinsky, Frogen Mirinsky from Velaki. Okay, cool. So that's the first possible encounter. Uh, traveling the Stani heading to this air pool. Do I still want that? No. Maybe I'll just have them run into... Well... No, 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 no. Um, I actually don't want these. Get rid of those. That. And that. Um... Crumbling tower above a bone-strewn courtyard. I like that. Um, leading to a crumbling tower above a bone-strewn courtyard. Inside is a bone blackguard. Um, inside is an undead. Uh, maybe a powerful undead. Inside is a ghast. Is a ghast who has eaten the boy. Yeah. So I don't know what they'll get from that. There might be a treasure there. Maybe. Um, yeah, so those are those two runes they're leading to into the woods. Um, travel over to Lucky 2d6 d6 plus 2 wolves led by an alpha. That's something that could happen easily. And then the bat swarms. I don't like that because they're both basically the same. Um, these are not going to happen. Deleting that. So really it's just these three. So is this really going to be enough for a whole session? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frogan Marinsky, if he tells them he has something, but he things are going around, they'll talk to him. Now, I don't, again, I don't think they're going to spend the whole session on the road. So this is this will be sufficient. Um, yeah, and then the Velaki Valley, which I haven't done yet, but I'll do it at some point. So we have Swalich Woods, Barovian Basin, travel on the road to Velaki. Um, inside is a ghast, or 71. Who's eating the boy? All right, cool. Um, well, I think that is sufficient for this video. Again, I'm not sure what the... Um, I'm just trying to record whenever I prepare, and you know, I don't know who watches it, but uh, you know, if it's interesting, it's interesting. If it's not, you know, whatever. <laughs> anyway, I hope it has been interesting, um, at least a little bit. And um, as I said, we probably we won't be playing this weekend, so I won't have an update over the course of the week. But I'll do another prep video, and that one will be more practical, where I just sit down with the Book of Curse of Strahd, take Bone Grinder, and adapt it to Shadow Dark, kind of right there. And that might be a bit longer of a video because, uh, well, all of my videos go longer than I think they will, but um, it might be a bit longer of a video just so that I can kind of go through it bit by bit and show you what I would do to actually transition certain monsters over to, and certain kind of like my methodology of how I would change one kind of encounter into another. Anyway, I'll let you guys go. Um, hope you have a great week. See you. See you soon.